The spirit of religiosity, lesson nine, overcoming this demon. I, when I was writing this lesson, I thought, well, I could do a lesson nine, just kind of review the other eight. And the more I tried to do that, the more it did not fit. So I was like, all right, Lord, what would you have us do? And so I kind of led the overcome this demon. Now, hopefully we can see it through every lesson. We've ha- had little tidbits of how to overcome each and every part, applying the word of God, um, looking at it in that regard, kind of keeping both balances of the spirit of religiosity, but how to overcome it, and kind of going back and forth. But for this lesson, we're going to talk strictly on how to overcome this demon, because especially in our region, this demon is very strong. It has its talons, for lack of a better word or a better example, has its talons in a lot of Christians in a lot of this area, and it's deep-rooted. It is very deep-rooted. So the spirit of religiosity is a very dangerous demon to combat, but it can be overcome by a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. The spirit of religiosity is a very dangerous demon to combat. It means you don't go willy-nilly, you don't go half-hearted and fight this thing, which is what gets many people in trouble. Then they wind up, when they try to confront it, and if they're not really walking with God, or if they don't have the endurance, then you start confronting this thing. This thing's going to turn around and bark at you really bad, and it's going to start flexing its muscles, and then all of a sudden you start backing down because you don't have the endurance, you don't have the relationship with God to overcome. But it can be overcome through a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This is how we overcome this demon. This is how we overcome this spirit. Religiosity is a lower form of blasphemy that has not reached its highest stages due to the nature of falsely serving God with words, but a heart that is far from God. That's the reason we can say that it's close to blasphemy is because you are labeling yourself as a Christian, but yet when it comes to actual having that relationship, you have nothing. You're, you're null and void of any real substance. So religiosity is a lower form of blasphemy that has not reached its highest stages yet. So if we're not careful, it will, get, it will point us that direction because if we keep telling the Holy Spirit, no, 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 leave me alone, no, 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 leave me alone, no, I'm not going to be convicted of that, no, I don't want to change this, I'm going to stick with my religiosity, you keep quenching the Spirit, and then the next thing you know, you'll, be, you'll blaspheme the Spirit, and then you'll be turned over to a reprobate mind, and then you're stuck in your religiosity for all eternity. That's the sad part of this. So we must be, we must be led by the Spirit. If we're led by the Spirit and have a true relationship with God, you're not going to go wrong, because God's not going to lead you wrong. So we've got to stick with, with the Word of God, stick with the Spirit of God. So we can see these verses, Isaiah 29, 13, Matthew 15, 8, and Ezekiel 33, 31. That shows us the examples of Jesus even quoting Isaiah and the Old Testament even talking about the people of God serving God falsely with their words, but their heart is far removed from God. So this has been something that's not new to us, not new to mankind, not new to even our region But for this region, it seems to be the mountain that it keeps circling. So blasphemy is a dangerous slope for Christians to play on, knowing the things of God, then turning away. Blasphemy is a dangerous slope because if you start peeking over the edge, you start peering over the edge, you start playing with that slope, you're going to slide off real quick. And it's a dangerous thing, especially in these last days. In these last days, this is no time to play games, no time to be dancing around a dangerous area. So Luke 12, verse 10, And everyone who makes a statement or speaks a a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. So this is Jesus speaking. He says, if you blaspheme me, if you blaspheme the Son of Man, he said, it can be forgiven you. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, that is, whoever intentionally comes short of the reverence due to the Holy Spirit. Some people I've heard, I I I hope I never blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I hope I never do it accidentally. Well, Looking at the amplified version of this, whoever intentionally, it's almost like, in my mind, the the mark of the beast, it's not something that you'll take accidentally. You'll have to be very intentional in doing it, of saying, I'm receiving this, and I'm telling you, God, I don't need you, I don't want you. I'd rather receive this than you. So in this case here, it's like, I would rather put down the Holy Spirit, I I would rather not reverence the Holy Spirit and to reverence whatever else, but put down the things of God, put down the things of the Holy Spirit. But it says it will not be forgiven him. For, for him, 
there is no forgiveness. That is black and white Bible. We can't argue that. So now many people will say, well, blasphemy kind of looks different to different people. That may be, but the heart of it is when you intentionally come short of reverence due to the Holy Spirit, that's what this is saying. So we've got to be careful that we honor the Holy Spirit, that we judge fruit accurately. So Matthew 12, 31, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy, every evil, abusive, injurious speaking, and indignity against sacred things can be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not and cannot be forgiven. Again, this is Jesus speaking, Matthew's account of this. So if we look at this, every sin and blasphemy... Every evil speaking, abusive, injurious speaking, indignity against sacred things can be forgiven. So you blaspheme a preacher, you blaspheme a church, okay, well, that can be forgiven. Sin, blasphemy can be forgiven. But when you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, that is what God and even Jesus, because remember, Jesus only speaks what the Father, he's heard the Father say. That's what he says in the Gospels as well. I only speak what I hear my father say. I only do what I've seen my father do. So that means that God has obviously said this. So we need to be careful what we're saying against the Holy Spirit or what we're saying about the Holy Spirit. So I dare say maybe those that are ignorant to the things of the Holy Spirit, there may be some grace because they're ignorant. They don't know any better. But for those that have tasted the things of God and then slack off or back off, and then they start blaspheming, blaspheming, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that's a completely different story because you know better. That's like if, you know, if one of my older sons was to do something, the six-year-old, didn't, he, if he didn't know what to do, but he did it, and then I had one of the older two, if they did it and they knew better, the punishment's going to look different. So we can understand that. So God's a, he's a just God. He's a holy, righteous judge, so he's going to be able to discern, okay, this is intentional and this is not, which even goes back to Luke uh, 12, verse 10, whoever intentionally, not ignorantly, whoever intentionally does this. So these verses display the dangers of blasphemy. Blasphemy is defined as to defame, speak evil of, or to speak lacking reverence or proper respect. Religiosity does this in both ditches, making it common, a common theme of this demon. Legalistic religiosity blasphemes by making their action more important than a relationship with God. The action's more important than God. That is dangerous. Because then, you, then you've got, you're fulfilling exactly what the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, and the liars did. You're just doing the action with no heart. Well, that's like being in a marriage but having no heart for it. What, what good is that? Why would, you, why would you even pursue a relationship if you're not intending on, for, you know, Seeing it out, seeing it played out for all eternity or for until death do you part. But for this, we can see that the legalistic religiosity blasphemes by making their action more important than a relationship with God. There are some denominations who emphasize baptism, water baptism, we'll say, and they get so hung up on that that they can say, well, if you get water baptized, you can live however you want to after that. That is heresy. That's blaspheming the Holy Spirit in a roundabout way. So we've got to be careful that we're not falling into the religious act and walking away from a relationship. We need to have the relationship which will produce the actions. So while the loose morals religiosity blasphemes by lacking reverence for God and the things of God as holy, even as major as unclean living. So then you have the flip side of that. So the legalistic does the proper action without a relationship, but on the flip side of that with the loose morals, they just lack reverence for the things of God. They have no heart for God. They just do whatever they want to, thinking, well, I believe in God, so he's got to bless me. He's got to take care of me just because I believe that he's there. Well, (laughs) if you believe the president's there, that doesn't mean he's got to help you. Although he may be there. But just because you believe he's in the White House doesn't mean he has to help you. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of examples running through my mind. I'm like, okay, we've got to move on. I turn into our whole message this morning. 
So the method of victory against this spirit is to build faith and to serve God with all one has, especially the heart. The method of victory against this spirit is to build faith. How does faith come? By hearing. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but then you also have the attitude to serve God with all one has. So you got to do it with everything that's within you. That sounds like a verse, especially the heart, because we've already seen that if we don't do it with the heart, God says it's null and void. So Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we need to have our hearing. We need to have our ears turned on, our spiritual ears turned on to the things of God to build our faith because it leads us to our next verse, Hebrews eleven six, and it's impossible to please God without faith. So you've got to be spiritually hearing to build your faith, and if you don't have faith, you can't please God. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and Oh, wait a minute. We just blew half of Christians out of the water right there with the word and. Because many people say, well, he, anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists. Okay, well, that's awesome. That's where they stop. But the word and says that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. That means you've still got to go after him. That means you've still got to have a heart for him. So if we're not careful, we'll leave out the heart. Well, all oh, God exists. So I'm, I'm right with God just because I believe he exists. Well, there's many people that believe Santa Claus exists, and he does them no good because he's not real. I can't tell you the kind of disappointment I had growing up. Santa Claus is real. Santa Claus is real. And then all of a sudden I realized Santa Claus ain't real. That's why I teach my kids Santa is not real. So that way they don't start questioning, well, Eddie said that Santa Claus is real. And he taught me about that, but then he had to tell me when I grew up that Santa Claus isn't real. He's been telling me about Jesus and God my whole life. Is that false now? All because you wouldn't parent with truth and transparency by the Word of God. But see, many Christians fall in that same boat. They, oh, I believe God exists. I believe God exists. He's going to take care of me. He's going to help me get to heaven. And then when they get to heaven, he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Well, I believed in you. Well, I believe Chevrolet is a good vehicle. That doesn't help me get to heaven. I believe Nissan's awesome. That doesn't get me into heaven. What you really believe and seek after will change your life. So when you really believe that God exists and that he is your God, then you'll follow after him. You're going to pursue him. Just like you would, like especially men, if you believe that a, that a certain woman is supposed to be your spouse, you're going to pursue after her. So we're to all pursue after God. To say, God, I want you in my life. You mean more to me than anything else. I need you. It's for, see, 1 John 5, 4, For every child of God defeats this evil world. Hmm. And we achieve this victory through our faith. How can we overcome? Through our faith. But if you don't have your spiritual ears turned on, if you're not chasing after God, then your faith's not going to be built up and you won't overcome this world. All you'll be doing is going in this do loop of fighting the world, fighting the world, fighting the world, fighting the world. You never get victory because you never overcome your flesh. You never overcome sin. You never overcome the things of the world. So you're just stuck in that do loop. So Christian's faith sets them up for victory and success. A Christian's faith, their faith, Actual biblical faith. Faith that is not only what you believe in your heart, but what you speak with your mouth and the way that you live your life. A Christian's faith sets them up for victory and success. This is why the spirit of religiosity makes such an attack on a walk with God to include the deception of a label while removing the substance of the relationship. <laughs> There's some people that believe well, if I, can, if I can get engaged, then that, then that means that they're going to commit to me. Then once I get married, then I can do whatever I want to. I can run around all I want to because now I've got a ring, and now it's going to be harder to separate, so I can do whatever I want to once, I get, once we say I do. That's not a way to live your life. That's not what true commitment's all about. That's not having faith in your marriage. That's having faith in your sinful self. So with that in mind, some people do that with their Christianity. Well, once I have a relationship with God, I can just roll around and whore with the world. But no, 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 that's not how God's designed it. 
God's designed it for us to be faithful unto Him until we die. That's the reason it's called endurance. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So even that is your clause to say, even though you start a relationship with God, doesn't mean that you're going to make it. You've got to endure. You've got to stay with Him. Walk with Him. Stay current with the Holy Spirit. Be in the Word. Be in prayer. Have this relationship with Him. If you don't work on your relationship with God, it's going to die. It's much like a marriage. If you don't work on your relationship, it's going to die. So you've got to work on your relationship. But see, if you're lazy, you don't want to work on anything. If you're lazy, you just all you care about is just the, self, the, the sinful indulgence. <laughs> that, uh, all right, Lord. Most people that really have given in to the, to the self-indulgence, especially of pornography, most of them go nowhere in life because they're obese. They watch pornography and they do things with their body sexually to please themselves for self-gratification. They go nowhere in life because they're lazy. How does this fit into religiosity? It's all, it's all with, with, all with laziness and not walking with God, not willing to do what it takes to work on a relationship. A true relationship with God said, you know what, God, I'm going to overcome this, I'm going to overcome this, I'm going to overcome that, and I'm not going to be lazy in this area, I'm going to actually do something about it. So even with that, if we're not careful, we won't do what we need to do to work on the areas of our life and as much as people will say, well, that pornography, man, that's bad stuff. That's just, that's just horrible. I don't know why anybody won't get addicted to that. Well, what's your sin? Because we all have something that we're fighting against. We all have something that we're maybe contend against. So what is our area that we've gotten lazy and religious? Well, God knows my heart. God sees it. God covers it up. God gives me grace. But remember, God has long suffering, not forever suffering. So just because you start saying, well, God knows my heart there, that's, that's a sorry but excuse of religiosity. That's exactly what that is. Well, God knows my heart. Yeah, He does. He knows that you're bent toward that, bowing to that more than you will Him. <laughs> self glory and narcissism. <laughs> narcissism accompany religiosity. self glory which... We could even tie back to our pornography example, self glory self-gratification, and narcissism. Everything's all about you. Accompany religiosity. Along with this attitude comes the lack of acknowledgement of sin in one's own life, but an abundance of pointing it out in the lives of others without biblical authority. Because if you're not careful, people say, well, they're just religious. Why is he always preaching on my sin? That's biblical authority. But those that don't have the biblical authority, they'll point out everybody else's sin, as we're about to see, out of self-glorying and narcissism. Because they want the attention on them. Well, I'm better than them. I don't give in to pornography. Yeah, but you give, up, you give in to being a, lying, a liar and a gossip. You give in to blaspheming in the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So the legalistic ditch will point out sin in everyone else to display their own piety. The loose morals ditch will point out the sin or flaws in the people that have a heart for God to excuse their own choice of lukewarmness. So I'm going to read that again. The legalistic ditch will point out sin and everyone else to display their own piety, which is like the Sadducees, the Pharisees. You know, they brought the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Why did they bring her? Because they all thought, well, we've got somebody. This is going to make us feel good to stone somebody else to death. And we're going to even, while we're doing this, we're going to entrap Jesus to get him so that we can call him out on something. But what's funny is when that happens, Jesus begins to rot in the dirt. Then all of a sudden, one by one, they begin to leave. Why? Because they were all religious. Because they had things that didn't quite, wasn't quite up to muster when it came to the things of actually having a relationship with God. Because even Jesus said, he without sin cast the first stone. Hmm. We all deal with sin. We all contend with it. We all are able to overcome it. But when you have biblical authority, you help people out of that sin. You point out things with the word of God. You don't Bible thump people and just go around and beating them and, 
And well, you're going to hell, you're doing this, you're doing that. There's a few preachers in this region that are good for that. They're not good for much else, but they're good for running people down and making them feel horrible. That's what they're good at. But when you have the truth presented with itself, all you got to do is present the truth by the word of God, and it's going to make people make the choice. Either, either I can line it with the word of God and have the freedom to, to be made free because of now choosing to accept the truth and apply it to my heart and life, or I can turn away from it, and now I'm going to suffer the consequences for it because the, the wages of sin is death. But without that biblical authority, people will use the same excuse of, well, I'm just, I'm just, well, the word says this, the word says that. Well, that's good. But what a biblical authority do you have in, in that person's life to say that? Now, if you're a witness, you don't, have to, you don't have to run around convicting people. Well, you shouldn't do that. If you do that, you're going to hell. If you're a witness, all you got to do is just speak the word. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. Well, if, you're, if you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you and you're baptizing the Holy Spirit especially, and you have that power and authority, you speak something like that, it's going to convict people and you don't have to say anything else because they're going to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit of your walk with God and that's not being religious, that's having a true relationship. While on the flip side, somebody that's very religious, they got to browbeat people and just beat the mess out of them with the word and just really condemn them and not convict them. That shows religiosity. The loose morals ditch will point out the sin or flaws in people that have a heart for God. This is what they love to do. They love to manipulate. Why you gotta why you gotta preach like that? Why you gotta why are you holier than thou? That's what they'll say. Stuff like that. Why? Because they know their own flaws. They know you live holy. They know that you have a heart for God. So they do that to excuse their own choices out of lukewarmness, which is what the rest of this says. Acts 15, 1. And, a certain, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the, the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Well, we know from the book of Acts, if you keep reading this, this is false. They're focused on the act and not a walk with God. This is the book of Acts. This is after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so you still have these Judaizers, which the Bible talks about, Judaizing teachers. They still come and they talk about it. It's all about the action. It's all about the action. And they even take out the heart of it. But here the Judaizing teachers were more focused on the act of physical circumcision, while God is looking for the circumcision of the heart and fleshly desires after Jesus' resurrection. Matthew 7, 3 and 4. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? That shows us, even from the Bible, that we're to deal with our own self, to have our own walk with God. Not to be pious, not to have religiosity ourselves, but to have an own walk with God. Then that means we're constantly working on ourselves and we're constantly bringing things before God to say, God, help me with this. Lord, you know I need help, help in this. This is a weak area. I need this weak weakness to become a strength. I need this area in my life. I need you to help me, Father. Give me strength. Give me wisdom. Help me. Give me endurance to overcome this. And with that kind of heart, when you go to help somebody else that has a speck in their eye, it's not you've got this big massive beam and you're just really wanting to hit somebody with it. What you're wanting to do is to really help them because you know what it feels like to have something in your life that needs to be dealt with. And you do it out of love and concern, not religiosity. Religiosity leans more on the natural world than the spiritual. The answer to this demon is having a heart to help others, not only out of maturity, but also from a heart of love. Matthew 7, 2. For you will be treated as you treat others. Oh, there's something to think about. That's the golden rule. You will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Hmm. John 13, 34. I give you a new commandment. <laughs> Let me back up. So I said, man, they're just harsh. All they do is judge me. All they do is just run me down. They run this and run that, run that down in my life. Well, maybe what you're doing is because you have judged somebody else so harshly that was trying to serve God or whatever the case may be, 
because you're so loosey-goosey in your morals, you perceive that when somebody else speaks the truth, you perceive it as the same judgment you passed on somebody else. Because isn't this what this word says? The, same, the standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged? If you're so harsh on somebody, then will it, will it not come back to you as seeming as harsh? But if somebody's actually doing it in love, I can't tell you how many people that I've given the word to or given scripture to, not even preaching like I do here, be, actually being nice, believe it or not, being nice and giving the word and trying to encourage somebody, well, you, that's, just, that's just too hard. I don't know why you got to say it like that. I don't know why you got to talk to me like that. I was actually being nice. If you think that's hard, man, you're not going to like my preaching. You're not going to like coming to my church. Go find you some lukewarm church to go on to. Because you may fit in better there. Because they'll pet you. They'll pet you while they rob your pocketbook. They'll pet you as you play with demons and sin. Anyway, John 13, 34. I give you a new commandment that you should love one another just as I have loved you. So you too should love one another. So we can see even the apostle of love, John, we're to love one another. If we have this, if we have a really love with God, then we're going to love one another. And that love, <laughs> biblical love, will also mean when you have the biblical authority that you speak the truth to somebody and you say, listen, you shouldn't do that. You should abstain from the appearance of evil. You should, you should be able to do this, do this, do this part of the word and give a verse to back it up to show that, look, I'm the biblical authority in your life. I'm here for a reason. You can do what you want to. You're a grown adult. But in this, in this area, I'm a biblical authority, so I'm trying to speak into your life to help you. Then it's their choice. Now, if it's your child, that's a different story. Because especially when they live in your house and they're underage, then you have that authority over them. Wait a minute now. If you're not going to listen, if you're not going to align your heart with the word of God, if you're not going to align your, your heart with how I'm trying to parent you, then we have discipline coming. Why you got to be so mean to your kids? I'm trying to keep them out of hell. And the word tells us that we're to discipline our kids. And if we don't, then we don't love them. That's the word of God. So Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares the rod of discipline hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines diligently and punishes him early. Let's read that again. He who spares the rod of discipline hates his son. So if even in, even in spiritual terms, not just parenting and, and children, but even in spiritual parenting and spiritual children, he who spares the rod of discipline hates his son. But he who loves him disciplines diligently and punishes him early. Why? So that way he doesn't go any longer of creating this bad habit. The, more, the longer you do something, the more it's going to become a habit to you. And the earlier you can catch it and weed it out, the easier it's going to be. But the longer you let something sit, the harder it's going to get to break that habit and to break out of that sin. A true heart desires to help a person mature in every area of life, especially with their relationship with God. A person given to this spirit of religiosity only desires independence and pointing out flaws in others as a boost of self-esteem. Part of this self-esteem issue is having a desire to reap without sowing. To reap without sowing. Attempting to reap the benefits of being a Christian without sowing the word of God in their own life or the efforts of sowing into a relationship with God. This creates a pride or arrogance within self in either ditch while removing this person further from God. So in other words, you want to be the farmer when it comes time to reap, but you don't want to be the farmer when it comes time to sow. But sowing the word of God is what helps you reap the benefits. Sowing the word of God and sowing prayer time, sowing the things of God into your life, that makes the harvest so much more sweeter. I know that wasn't proper English, but we're in Sparta. So it's about the same. Makes it so much sweeter is that when that harvest comes in. I mean, can you imagine a farmer and his family who has put so much work into sowing and seeing so many acres being plowed and taken care of, and then all of a sudden here comes the harvest, and they're reaping thousands of dollars or whatever the case may be. They're reaping it in. They're reaping in not only that, but the harvest. 
They're keeping some for themselves because they may need it, but they're selling the rest of it to reap in the money that they have need of for their family to be taken care of. How much more are they going to appreciate that harvest because they know how much work it took to go into it? But all, if all you ever do is try to reap, then without sowing, you're not going to reap much. Because the Bible says you'll, sow, you'll reap what you sow. That's a guarantee. You're only going to reap what you sow. You sow discord, you sow confusion, you sow religiosity, that's what you're going to reap. You sow the word of God, you sow prayer time, you sow a relationship with God, that's what you're going to reap. That's the reason God's promises are conditional. Why? Because how much work are you going to put into it? How much of the relationship are you going to go after God in for him to actually honor that relationship? So weapons to overcome. To overcome such a a deceptive spirit, each person must notice signs of the fruit of religiosity when they discover the root of it coming from within their life. A root grows under the surface but feeds what is viewed above. Victory will not come unless the root is dealt with. Victory will not come unless the root is dealt with. It's just like going to the doctor. If you go and and you... Now, there are some things that they can only treat symptoms. And that's, that's... your body just naturally processes whatever that is out because the, you give medicine to help with the symptoms, but the root of it is they can't really deal with it. It's viral or whatever the case may be. There are other things that may have symptoms, but they can actually go after the root cause within your body and help you to overcome it all. That's what we're talking about here is in our lives, many times we'll have a symptom of an anger or symptom of depression or symptom of this or symptom of that. But what is the root cause of it? It's probably a lack of relationship with God. It's probably something bigger on the inside that is not being dealt with, but the symptom just comes out in another manner. The first weapon of a Christian has to overcome the spirit of religiosity is the Word of God. The Word of God should be one, be one of the first weapons a Christian uses in every scenario. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This weapon is also a source of truth, a source of happiness, a source of power, a source of spiritual growth, a a source of guidance, a source of comfort, a source of protection, and a source of victory. The word of God penetrates this demon when backed by a, humble, by a humble but bold heart and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Notice, the, only, the, the, the true effectiveness of the Word of God is backed with a humble heart. Humble but bold. Humble but bold. And the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The legalistic ditch is addressed much like the Pharisees and Sadducees in Jesus' time, while the loose morals ditch is rebuked for a lower standard of living than God's Word. Christians need the word of God to be accurate. The second weapon Christians have to overcome this demon is the Holy Spirit. But if you're allergic to the Holy Spirit, then how how is he going to help you? (laughs) Because many many denominations, many class of Christians, they're allergic to the Holy Spirit. They don't want to hear what he's got to say. Anyway, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. The Holy Spirit is a remembrancer. He's a helper in weakness. He is a witness of Jesus Christ. He's the spirit of truth. He's an interceder in prayer. He's the giver of power as a witness. He's a convincer or rebuker. He's the agent of salvation. He's a guide. He's a revealer. He's a fruit bearer. He's an exhibitionist, meaning he can show off through people. He's a sanctifier. He's a, and a tongues equipper. Notice we have scripture for every one of these. This is how much the demon of religiosity wants to say, no, 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 don't believe that. You need to believe this. When we have things to back it up with the word of God. <laughs> but the spirit of religiosity wants you to take those verses out. No, I don't listen to that. Don't, listen, don't apply that. Don't listen to him. If you do, you'll build your faith and you'll get rid of me. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to that person. <laughs> this weapon anoints Christians to have power over all demons, especially this one. And leads God's people in righteousness. Hmm. Lead you in righteousness. Not lead you into being a spiritual whore. Not lead you into other things as darkness. 
either ditch does not like to be led by God's Spirit into holiness, making this weapon vital to having victory. You need to be led by the Spirit to have victory. Another weapon Christians have to conquer, this Spirit is a local pastor. Now, I don't want this to come across as self-serving, but I know the power of the Word, and the Word is the Word, and I know the power of, of applying this to my own life with my pastor. The local pastor is given by God after his own heart. An overseer of the flock to care for the people, given by Jesus as a gift to mature the saints, a watcher of the souls within the church, a qualified overseer. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That knocks out mm, probably a third of the pastors I know. And I don't say that to puff myself up. I say that because Many of them called themselves out. They weren't called out by God. They weren't sent out by, by the presbytery laying hands on them and sending them out because they qualified. They set themselves out and set themselves up. A qualified overseer, a minister of the word at all times. <laughs> that, this is one fruit I judge, and you should be able to judge the same fruit. You can judge me, you can judge other pastors. When, when ministry is in you, it'll come out of you. Now, that really applies to any kind of ministry. But when I get around other pastors, it's almost like we can hear something and we can say, man, that'll preach. And it's like you can take like 30, 30 to 45 seconds and talk about how that can preach. Pastor Chris and I do that all the time. Some other good, mighty men of God I run with, they do the same thing. But I'm also mindful of the ones that I get around and they don't say that. I'm mindful of that because when, when it, something really good like that, that's a nugget from God or even just something that can be flipped so easy into a message, it's like it bears witness with the mighty men of God that are like, mm, yeah, that'll preach, man, that's good. I mean, it could be something so simple. But then the other ones are like, I'll get mine offline, so I don't know what that means. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> man, it wasn't meaning for it to come out like this this morning. Praise God. A minister of the word at all times, an example of faith and life of the word. A worker rightly handling the truth of God, a leader of God's people into the rapture. Means the pastor should be going too. He shouldn't be left behind. A teacher of sound doctrine with the ability to rebuke for safety. Oh, there's something you don't hear much. Let's read that one again. That's a good one. A teacher of sound doctrine with the ability to rebuke for safety. Not for piety, for safety. And a preacher helping declare the truth. This weapon is established by God the Father, but given by Jesus Christ to help God's people grow up, stay on track, and not stay the same. Grow up, stay on track, and not stay the same. These attributes make the local pastor important to staying in a proper relationship with God. The next weapon Christians have to overcome this demon is a humble heart. A humble heart is teachable, is given grace by God, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, is able to be exalted by the Lord, a seeker of God receiving forgiveness and healing, the attitude of Jesus Christ, and the proper, walk, or the proper attitude to walk with God. This weapon is needed in addition to each of the other weapons. A humble heart keeps Christians impressionable by the things of God to submit, to love, and to honor God no matter the circumstances. So really you need a humble heart in addition to all of these other weapons. Because without a humble heart, you'll get prideful, you'll get arrogant, and the other weapons will do you no good. Because you'll begin to say, well, I can do this on my own. I can do that on my own. I don't need a pastor. I don't need the Word. I don't need the Holy Spirit. I don't need... And But with a humble heart, you know... God, I need everything you can give me. I need everything you got for me, God. So a humble heart is vital to repentance and righteousness. Lastly, a hunger and thirst for God and His righteousness can help Christians to have victory over this spirit. People who who hunger and thirst for God will be satisfied by God. They will feast and drink from Jesus. Will seek God, not themselves are satisfied by walking with God, not satisfied with their flesh. Receives everything is sweet. Oh. Hmm. Let me read that one again. 
receives everything as sweet. Proverbs 27, 7. That means even when something may taste bitter in the moment, you're like, man, I don't like that taste, but I know it's, I know it's good for me. I know it's good for me. So, Father, it's sweet to my soul. It's sweet to my being because it's confronting something in my life that I don't like right now, but it is, I receive it as sweet because it's going to help me. And are given all things that are needed. This weapon keeps a person dependent on God for supply in every season of life. Losing this weapon will begin a search in other places that cannot fulfill in the same manner as God does. Using this weapon will keep Christians seeking God on a regular basis as part of their spiritual life and away from the deception of the demon of religiosity, especially when applied with the other weapons. So we must have a hunger and thirst for God and His righteousness. So the fruit of a relationship with God is salvation and blessing. That should be the fruit of your salvation. The fruit, or the fruit of your relationship, excuse me, is salvation and blessing. Not only is it salvation, because remember, salvation is more than just us making it to heaven. Because when you have soteriology, the study of salvation, it's broken down into three parts. Justification, that's what happens when you're first born again, just as if you'd never sinned. It's all washed away, wiped away. Jesus cleanses us and helps us. Then you have sanctification, which is what we live out until the day we either die or raptured out of here. And that is us, that is us cleansing ourselves, sanctifying ourselves, setting ourselves apart, getting rid of the things that don't belong. It's kind of like spring cleaning all of your life. <laughs> you tossing out the things that you don't need tossing out the things that are cluttering up your life tossing out the things that are dirtying your temple of God you, just, you start pitching things out pitching things out and you, you just keep windling down all the sins and all the hindrances that does so easily beset you and get rid of them, get rid of them, get rid of them and <laughs> as I say that I think of how many Christians are so, in, are, are so into a bless me club that all they care about is receiving and not getting rid of things that's a hoarder mentality. That's a Christian hoarder mentality. Is when all you're focused on is, God, what can you give me? God, what can you give me? God, what can you give me? God, give me. I receive, I receive. I get ready, I'm getting ready, I'm getting ready, getting ready. I'm getting ready, I'm getting ready. Receive whatever you have for me, God. No, 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 no. God says, dump it out. Get rid of things. Get rid of things. Because even pagans, we'll say even in Jonah's time and things of that nature, what they do when, the, when everything started getting rough? They started tossing things overboard. So if the pagan fishermen can understand this, we as Christians need to understand this. Is this is how we lighten the load, lighten the things out of our life. It's about getting rid of the sin. Because remember, Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So that means any of the weights and the hindrances that does so easily beset us besides our sin is going to be that's th things that stand opposite of Jesus Christ that we need to toss anyway. So may we get rid of those things. But the fruit of a relationship with God is salvation and blessing. And just to finish it up, the third part of soteriology is glorification. That's when you receive your glorified body. When you make heaven and you receive, you're no longer in your natural body, and this physical body that we see is the flesh, but we receive our glorified body. But this fruit is not produced by either ditch of religiosity, but only through a true walk with God. The evidence of a right heart before God is the word lived out, not only in action or the words one may speak, but a heart that displays the presence of God each day. It's not about your words. It's not about your actions. It's about your heart. It's about having a heart that displays the presence. Why is that so important? Because when God is on the inside of you, he will come out of you. Whatever is on the inside of you is going to come out of you. If you got the right action... That's going to be evident. And people are going to say, well, they got the right action, but they have no heart for God. Well, they got the word. They speak the Christianese, as we call it. They got the right words, but something's off. But when you have the heart for God, his presence is going to be evident in your life by what you do, what you say. But it's going to be more evident because he is, his presence is upon you and in you, which sets you apart from anything else, from everybody else that doesn't have that same heart. Sets you away from the religious people, we'll say. May all Christians overcome the spirit of religiosity by knowing God, serving God, and loving God with a right heart all the days of their lives. Amen.